This is Interpreting Wine host and founder Lawrence Francis welcoming you to this, my Willamette Valley winemaker special. Across these 20 episodes recorded in quickfire fashion in January 2020, I got to meet a broad selection of people making wine in the region, both a variety of winemaking scale from the micro to the macro, and also different focuses that include different aging vessels, different grape varieties, sparkling wines, and of course, different interpretations of Pinot. Episodes are going to be released in the order that they were recorded, so you'll get to be a virtual guest on the tour. Two things you can do to help spread this series even further. One is to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already, either where you're listening or on your favorite podcast platform. And the second, the one that's really going to help push this out there, is to head to interpretingwine.com slash iTunes and leave a review letting me know what you think. A genuine huge, huge thank you in advance. Today's episode of the Willamette Valley Winemaker Special features Kate Norris of Division Winemaking Company. A passionate urban winemaker blending her experience traveling and making wine in France with her love for the state of Oregon, Kate tells us her origin story and transition into setting up Division Winemaking Company, taking a deep dive into winemaking practices and the overall ethos, before leading a tasting of five wines, a Chardonnay and a Sauvignon Blanc, two Gamay Noirs, and of course, a Pinot Noir. Enjoy. I uh, grew up in Europe, in England, but also in a small wine-producing village in the Auvergne region of France, which is in the Haute-Loire. Um, so wine has always been around me since I can remember. Um, being a small child, having it at the table mixed with water or just a thimble, um, it's a really important part of how my family shared. Um, and while my family doesn't make wine, um, they... Um, certainly are super psyched that I do. <laughs> um, I, I moved to the States for high school and for college. I moved to San Francisco, um, and I fell in love with Oregon wine when I lived in San Francisco. Um, and I was really, really curious about the region with my business partner, Tom. Um, we actually served, he's my business partner, he's actually my ex-husband too. We served Oregon wine at our California wedding uh, on a California vineyard. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I don't know if they noticed. Um, we and uh, we actually had a, a beautiful bottle of Pinot Noir at a really lovely restaurant in Berkeley that brought us up here to Portland uh, and then into the Willamette Valley to discover more. Um, and we decided to move back to France to learn how to make wine in Burgundy, Beaujolais, in the Loire, in the Auvergne, always with an idea to move back to Oregon because we'd fallen in love with um, the place, the people, the environment, the nature, the climate. It's an incredible place to make wine. Um, and so I worked for a um, larger winery down here in the valley. Um, Tom worked for another winery, and then we decided to start Division in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then we opened up our own winery space. So we were making it at another facility. Um, we opened our own space up in Portland as an urban winery in 2012. Um, yeah, so we make the... The wines we love to drink, um, inspired by the varieties that we worked with all over France. So um, we're in Oregon and we're in the Willamette Valley. So, of course, Pinot Noir is important to us um, and Chardonnay. But we also make a lot of Gamay. Um, and, um, and we also make wines not just from the Willamette Valley, but also from mid-Oregon, southern Oregon, and from Washington State. We have uh, um, vineyards that grow for us there, too. Okay, wow. So, so just there's, there's all, all over Oregon? All over Oregon. Yeah. So uh, the Willamette Valley, yeah. then the Umpqua, which mm -hmm. is down a little bit south of Eugene, mm -hmm. uh, and then in southern Oregon um, in the Applegate Valley, which is part of the Rogue Valley. Yeah. So all um, more on the western side of the state. There is a small growing region that's on the eastern side of the state also that's close to Idaho. Um, but we, have, we focus on the western side of the state. In terms of what you're doing now and, and, and kind of, yeah, that facility that you've started and, and where you, you still are operating out of, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just, yeah, giving us that kind of virtual tour almost 
of the, of that site and let us know what happens there because you know my understanding is that there's actually quite a bit that goes on there so i'd love to you know hear it directly from you definitely so um it is a 5000 square foot half of a building that's double that size that's right on division street in southeast portland which is a hub for people that love to eat um it's got some of the best restaurants in our city um, it's five blocks from my house, so I get to walk there every single day. Um, and when we were looking for a space in town, we decided we wanted, um, well, at first we were looking for a space just for us. And it was uh, sort of like a Goldilocks, too big, too small, all, you know, nothing was fitting. And then we started to think that maybe we should uh, create a, a collective winery. Um, so with a grouping of like-minded winemakers that made things that were similar in mindset but in different style. Tom and I are the owner-operators of the facility, um, and it, it operates as a custom crush, which is where we have other uh, wineries making their wine, too. Um, this year, we have 10 winemakers, 10 brands. We've had as many as 12. The first year, we had five. Um, and uh, we put 179 tons of fruit through the building from grape this year, not quite till bottle, our first bottling's in a couple of weeks. So um, it is a shared space uh, with 22 different varieties of grapes being vinified. Um, the smallest bottlings are about 25 cases, the largest being upwards of 1,000 cases. And then we have um, a small restaurant and wine bar that's in the space too, uh, that really allows us to connect with people that love wine and love food. Sometimes winemaking is a little bit behind closed doors, and I think that's just part of the fact that it's out in the countryside, that the facilities tend to be big buildings with walls, um, and we decided we really wanted people to be able to watch and to learn and to be a part of the process of the winemaking so that they could understand the journey that it takes to make wine, why it is special, uh, but why it's also just alcohol uh, that we make with our feet. <laughs> so a combination of both things in a really relaxed setting. So you can do tastings there, but it's mostly for chilling and for hanging out. We have a beautiful banquette that you can sit at in tables. It's how I enjoy wine with my friends, you know, uh, in like a cozy space, sitting down with some food and some good music. Sounds awful. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> I think what's, uh, yeah, it's really fascinating to, to kind of touch base with you because, you know, when I really was at the start of the podcast and was in London, um, you know, I didn't have the luxury of being able to go and meet winemakers at their facility. So I spoke with urban winemakers in London. I spoke to uh, like Warwick at Renegade and, uh, you know, there, there are... There are like a ton of other, but he was he was the first vagabond to them. Yeah, there, there, there's now there's now quite a few, and yeah, I'd almost kind of. You know, I think what would be really interesting is just to you know some reflections really on on that 2012 to 2019 period there, where you know you've you've had a lot of growth personally. Um, through the through the, the you know the number of cases you're making, and I'm sure in, in the experience, but then you know allied with that, you've had I guess different people kind of coming through the doors, or you know all the kind of different ideas, and maybe yeah sh shared philosophies and and uh, you know similarities on, on on certain levels, and yeah, just really I'm I'm really curious to hear like just some kind of reflections on that kind of dynamic, you know, as your experience and, and uh, yeah, the, the, the output that, you, that you've got has sort of grown and how, how has that interplay with the people that kind of come through the doors, you know, looking to learn, how has that kind of evolved over time? Yeah, I think, um, I think okay. what is the most important thing to start off with is that wine is ultimately something to share. Um, I, even when I open a bottle of wine by myself, I never hold that information to myself on how much I loved it or didn't like it. It's something I'm telling somebody else. Um, and so the thought of having a winery with multiple winemakers in it seemed ultimately natural to Tom and I, um, that it was just part of the whole process of what wine is. Um, 
and having those different ideas to bounce off of each other. Um, I think especially when you're a younger winemaker, because we started our own brand in 2010 and we opened the doors in 2012. That's uh, two vintages under our belt in Oregon. That's not very many. Um, being able to discuss and to talk and to think together, um, I think allows uh, a level of uh, learning um, that's very um, organic, um, but also very profound. Um, and the spheres of influence, I think that every single person that made wine there brought just their sphere of being, then allowed us all to have more confidence, us to have more information, um, and to have a bigger reach. Um, when we started, the, the winemakers that we had with us were all relatively the same size. One was a little bit bigger. Um, and we, we were all getting our chops underneath us and, um, and trying to make it happen. And um, part, of, part of the thought about that was that if I put my brand new little winery down in the Willamette Valley, it's not that far. I mean, it's the first wineries are 30 minutes out outside of town. Um, at the end of the recession, when, how would people come and vi- find me? How would they visit me? How could I expect somebody to get in their car and drive an hour to meet someone that they'd never met or never heard of and spend their uh, their fun money on, on me? Um, so we put it in town instead um, where people could walk. And the whole idea was to be um, the gateway drug to the Willamette Valley, to get people to be really excited about it um, because I really want people to take those wine trips. I want people to travel the world and to discover regions that they really love. But that doesn't happen right off the bat. You have to really feel like you've fallen in love with wine and you have to feel confident and you have to feel armed with enough information that you can go and do that, that, it, that, that, that it's something that you want to spend time on. Um, and then the whole thought behind the collective, it's pretty relaxed. Um, wine can be really snooty sometimes um and rightly so it's expensive to make and it is precious in its own right but i also don't think it's so snooty and so precious that we shouldn't open it enjoy it and just think it's booze too um and we really want to straddle that line and sort of bring wine to the people in a way um and have them fall in love with wines that are made by hand um and to understand why those wines can be a little bit more costly and they get to watch us doing that. They get to watch us during harvest. They get to watch how hard we're working. Um, and they get to fall in love with the story and come back and tell it. So, I love it. That's amazing, you know, and, and I think it's, I'm so happy that we, we you know, we have made it work and we've, and we've managed to have this time to speak because that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, yeah, the, I totally get the, the, the snooty element sometimes and sometimes people are, are put off. But at the end of the day, it is just, you know, it's a cool... It's a good time. Thing it's a, yeah it's 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 fun it's a drink you know it's a drink that bottles a moment in time um, and people and the earth and uh, the vintage it bottles so much and then when it opens up it changes yeah it's it's it's, it's incredible it's um it, and uh, and it's meant for people to enjoy everybody to enjoy yeah. um, and I think that that's really important. Cool, cool, and, and yeah, and absolutely, and I think totally in line with that, you know, we've got five bottles of Division wine sitting here in front of us, looking, yeah, very, very elegant, <laughs> looking very drinkable, the tops are all off, <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, i just invite you to kind of introduce us, introduce me and the listener to them. Let's go for it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So we mentioned before the different regions that Tom and I worked in in France Mm -hmm. and the the wines we love. And so I brought a little bit of a range from the Willamette Valley, um, starting off with Chardonnay. Chardonnay is um, our most most increasingly planted white grape Mm -hmm. here. Um, And um, I love Chardonnay. I think Chardonnay in America has received a bad rap for a while. Uh, And I think Oregon is changing that. Um, and um, I'm really, really excited about that. I love Chardonnay. Okay. Um, so this one is... Let's yeah, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> the inside the glass. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, this first one is our uh, 2018 Chardonnay 1, I'm meaning one because it's our main cuvee for the vintage. Um, Tom and I work with a number of different vineyards in the Willamette Valley and we make just a couple of multiple vineyard blends. We make a multiple vineyard blend of Chardonnay, one of Pinot and one of Gamay. Uh, and so Chardonnay 1 is our Chardonnay blend of three different vineyards. Um, one of them is a biodynamic vineyard called Johan. Mm. Um, you had just talked to Brienne. I'm sure that you're mm. familiar with Johan. Absolutely. Yeah, and so um, this is D- uh, Dijon clone Chardonnay, uh, grown on marine sedimentary soil. And this part of the vineyard actually has a granitic bedrock to it that I think is really apparent in the wine. Um, blended with an old vine site called Eola Springs, um, Mendoza clone, and this. Part of the vineyard was planted from the late 60s to the early 80s. Um, Mendoza is a later ripening clone that's more familiarly seen in Mendoza, uh, but also in, um, in California. And when these vines were first planted uh, a few decades ago, and the climate was different here and it was a lot cooler, and the vines hadn't established themselves, they hardly got ripe. Um, and we are seeing a change, uh, especially with the age of the vines. They sort of beat to their own circadian rhythm. They ripen at their own pace now. And a warming of, the, of North America in general allows for these, uh, these grapes to come to full phenolic ripeness. And then the third vineyard that's blended into here is called Cassin Vineyard. This is a young vineyard that's over in the coastal range. It's considered Yamhill Carlton, and it's a, a, a type of jewelry um, that's uh, out there for soil. Um, So we have three different soil types, one sedimentary, one marine sedimentary, and then the third being jewelry, which is volcanic. Um, We uh, direct press this and ferment it in uh, stainless, neutral French oak, new Austrian oak, and um, aquaflex, which is a a water bet barrel that's dipped in hot water before it's toasted. Um, It goes through primary fermentation in barrel, finishes up its uh, malolactic at the beginning of the summer, so in 19. Um, gets a little bit of sulfur after mallow, tiny bit before um, bottling, um, and then it's released in the fall. So it was just released uh, last September. Okay. okay. The, um, yeah. the marine sedimentary soil from Eola Springs is the note that I feel the most in this wine right now. Mm-hmm. Um, a little saltiness mid palate, which I think is really pretty. Oh, and it's fun because I brought a Pinot from the same vineyard, so you'll get to taste Amazing. the salt in there too. <laughs> so Sauvignon Blanc, there's not very much planted in Oregon. Um, yeah, I'll go to the same glass. Um, but I, I think that it's really well suited to our region. Um, and this is um, Sauvignon Blanc. That's um, our fall release. We make one in the spring under our Division Village label. And then our fall release, we do wines that have aged um, almost up to a year, um, sometimes a little bit longer. And so this is from a little vineyard in the Eola Amity Hills AVA uh, called Redford Weddell. I also brought a Gamay from there, too, so we get to play with that. And um, it is a jewelry soil, so volcanic soil also. Um, It's planted... Uh, in 2006, um, and the vineyard is planted to uh, Gamay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, and Albarino. And um, we uh, wanted to make a Sauvignon Blanc from Oregon because it's uh, sort of a new frontier for us in terms of variety. And part of what's really interesting about Oregon is sort of that pioneering spirit Um, We have really done a great job with Pinot, making, uh, I think, um, establishing ourselves as a world-class Pinot region. But I think this is just the beginning. Yeah, Yeah, just just over 50 years of history, the French laugh. It's not that long, and they're right. So we have uh, plenty of other things to play around with. And so this Sauvignon Blanc, um, I really love. Um, Tom and I talk about Sauvignon Blanc a lot, and we're, we're not super into that like really grassy, really tropical uh, Sauvignon Blancs. We like ours with a little bit more depth, um, and pushing past those primary notes and getting more into secondary and tertiary tones. So we allow a little bit more ripeness on this. Um, it's some of the last fruit that we pick for the vintage. Also direct press and barrel fermented. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, 2017, there's a little bit of warmth uh, in the wine, too. Um, but I think it makes it a really great wintertime white. Love the description. And, um, you know, I, I love as well that you're, yeah, essentially even taking us away from these wines and, and you're just zooming out on the region. And, yeah, it's classical association with Pinot Noir and the, the kind of natural comparisons with Burgundy. And looking ahead as well it's like you know what else is is kind of possible out there you know i i in preparation for this trip i posted on my instagram like you know what are the questions that people have and um you know one of the questions was around exploration of terroir you know and 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 i just think that's you know a, a word that's probably bandied around a lot and and it, but it's just like yeah well you know learning by doing you know it's like you know we don't need to sort of hypothesize around um you know what's going to work here and you know as you say you know paraphrasing you you know we know pinot does great things here what else is there and you know that kind of pioneering spirit leads to yeah i think i think gorgeous gorgeous wines like like the both of these and yeah i don't have much to add on the on the actual description but uh i i will just really add just on the on that sauvignon i mean it's yeah you can sort of you know feel that it might have been a a hot year but it's come out lovely and balanced the acidity is still there the, the brightness is still there and i love it i think you you coined something new there as well a wintertime white i love it oh yeah yeah, rock and roll to the next one. So um, I actually think, yeah, let's do them side by side, actually. Well, actually, let's talk about them side by side first. Okay. Pour this one for sure. So talking about um, next-gen varieties for the Willamette Valley, um, I bang the Gamay drum really, really hard. Um, Gamay is my favorite red variety to drink on earth. Um, it is my everyday love, um, but can go from really fun and cheerful to really beautiful and serious and uh, moving. And the climate that we have in the Willamette Valley, the soils that we have here are perfect for growing Gamay. Um, when we started making Gamay, actually in 2011 was our first year, because 2010, Tom and I were um, making wine at a, a winery and vineyard called uh, Methan, which is in the Eel Amity Hills, and we noticed some Gamay that was planted right outside the, wine, uh, the, the actual winery facility. And we asked them what they were doing with it. And they're like, you can have it next year. So we took it um, and have um, a goal of making Gamay from the, each of the AVAs in the Willamette Valley. We also make one that's a multiple AVA all Oregon Gamay. Um, and um, it's really exciting to me to see the uh, Willamette Valley through the lens of Gamay in the same way that we've studied it through the lens of Pinot for 50 years. Um, this first one is our Gamay Cru, which is our Methan family vineyard. This is 2018. Um, so first vintage was 2011 of this. Um, the site's beautiful, so it's transitioning soils from sedimentary to volcanic. Um, we only make a few barrels of this. This is mostly traditionally fermented, so an open-top fermenter, but with a healthy amount of whole cluster in there, too. We do make some carbonic fermentation gamets also, but they tend to go into our spring bottling. And I am pouring this next to the Redford Weddell Gamay that I make, called Renardier, which is from a vineyard that's just down the way from uh, Methven. Um, for you to see the really distinct difference in place of, uh, of these two wines um, and to be able to sort of see, the, I think, the potential for Gamay. We're excited we started a... Uh, a festival called I Love Gamay uh, four years ago and uh, we thought maybe I'd get a, a few producers the first year and I think we got 20 and now it's gotten bigger we're taking it on the road we're going to go to the east coast and so because people love Gamay the methane's always more blue fruited to me um, a little bit more on um, some slatiness in terms of minerality um, and then this is Redford Weddell so this is all jewelry soil uh, volcanic uh, soil and tends to be much more red fruited and has um, more of this pine sap quality to it that I think is absolutely beautiful. We talk about how what's planted around vineyards can affect the flavor of the vines, and I think especially Gamay is a beautiful sponge for the permaculture um, and is able to sort of give you the flavor of Oregon. Um, it, it's absolutely beautiful. 
So same fermentation style between the okay. two of them. Yeah. So very, very, very. Uh, so identical fermentation style. Uh, neutral burial for uh, its aging. Mouths at the same time. Same amount of sulfur before bottling. Treated exactly the same way. And that's the. I guess the definition of study and uh, and in, in, yeah, show it, showing it, showing the terroir through the, through the through the wine and uh, just yeah, just tasting, yeah, really just absolutely gorgeous. I think it's, I think it, it, kind of how, what I want to come back on and the thing that's front of mind is really just you saying that it's your favourite type. I mean, I, I don't necessarily come across that and and you know, me, not, not to say it's a, it's a it's a forgotten, but I've I've heard like probably thousands of people saying pinot is their favorite or even like cab over here or, or, or chardonnay and you know gamay doesn't necessarily get that light but I, I i kind of refer to it as like a kind of a sleeper really because i think you know wines like these i think that i think they they are even potentially um you know gateway drugs you know they are they're not gonna sort of they're not, not necessarily challenging this is it. This is it. There's there's like bags of depth, and you know these these can you know totally be 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 spoken about, and um, you know in, in in the level that we're talking about in terms of them displaying and, and and representing the terroir, but they're just enjoyable. They're just they're just fun to drink. You know they're just really, you know I, I, it's it's come up a couple of times on the trip already. You know the, and, and you probably riff on this as well. But you know uh, my understanding is that for a lot of French winemakers, actually they talk about this idea of the wine that's not spoken about being like the best wine i mean it often gets translated rightly or wrongly as like glue glue you know it's just all you're hearing all night is that bottle going down and you know wines like these are just a pleasure to drink but they're gorgeous they're interesting and yeah they're who knows you know they're they're, hopefully they're going to be planted more in the future as well and more available for people to actually try yeah, I, I completely agree with you. My goal with wine is to, to look over at a dinner party and see someone trying to shake the last drop out of the bottle. And you know you nailed it, right? Like, I think I did well. Um, and Gamay does that. It really does. It, it, they're dangerously delicious uh, and, and easy. Um, and they do my favorite thing where you can make them as complicated in your mind as you want to. You can get really involved and think about soil, or you can just enjoy and drink. Um, and for me, that's those are my favorite wines in the world. The ones that are uh, that that you can, you can you can get as technical and as dorky as you want, or you could just just drink the whole thing. Mm-hmm. The bigger the bottle, the better, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't um, you can't make wine in the Willamette Valley and not make Pinot. Um, I guess you could, but uh, I think uh, that the, uh, Pinot is such a, a beautiful, complicated grape to chase. Um, and doing it well is my life goal. Um, and uh, this is my favorite vineyard of Pinot that Tom and I work with. Um, it's Eola Springs, which is actually part of the Chardonnay that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And this is um, vines that were planted in 1974 and 1983. Uh, um, so their own rooted pomard. Uh, on a part of the world that used to be the ocean. Uh, you walk through the vineyard and these big marine fossils, um, and you can really taste that depth, that salinity, but also this incredible sort of uh, nori seaweed umami uh, that pops out in the wine. It's um, we, um, also a combination of whole cluster and um, some distemmed, punch down some pump overs. Uh, unfiltered, unfined. Oh, and they're all indigenous yeasts. So yeah. all actually native yeast to each vineyard. We do a pied de cuve from each vineyard as the start up to make sure that the yeasts that are at the site are what kick off our fermentations. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I am. Um, it's a really, this is a special place in the world. Um, and I've been working with this vineyard since I first started making wine in Oregon. So yeah, I, I, I've got to say the, the the descriptions you're giving here are amazing, and and I was so intrigued. Everything you said about that Pinot, I thought I'm I'm going to love this because I I'm a you know love the love the freshness, love the love the cool climate, but if you can get me a wine and, and you talk to the salinity of it, then I'm I'm there, and and this is this is just is is gorgeous, you know. But it's but it's again, you know, I I guess back to the story, you know, back to why. 
why Pino is 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 a you know such an amazing expressor of that kind of sense of place and and why it, it kind of does so well here. You know, all of these examples of Pino that I'm having, they're they're all totally different. They, yeah. they really are, you know. And and I am, you know, endeavouring to to remember and making notes and and just trying to spend time with all of these. But you know, they all just really do have their own personalities. And and uh, you know, I, I'm totally blessed to be doing what I'm doing here during this week but uh, you know I, I, I hope it's the first visit of many because I just feel like I'm yeah exactly. it's a first start the surface. That's, yeah, it. that's it that's it that's it um, there's so much and, and you know Oregon is this you, even Americans sometimes don't know where Oregon is you know like you, you ask someone on the east coast and they like vaguely know that it's above California exactly I mean I, I went to high school on the east coast I would know I met one person from Oregon before I was 25 um there is so much here, and um, stylistically, there is so much diversity, um, which I really think is interesting. Um, people try all kinds of different things, and everybody using even the same sites are able to sort of coax out their own style of wine while not imposing that over the earth at the same time. The, the quality, the, the, the initial quality starts so high in Oregon overall, and it's, uh, I'm really proud to make wine here. It's, uh, it's a delicious place. So. Thank you so much, Kate. As I mentioned, it was a pleasure to meet with you on this occasion outside of the winery. A huge thank you also to Tom, who showed me around Division Winemaking Company a couple of days later, and whom I've already earmarked to appear on the podcast when he's next over in the UK. Do see below for the Division Winemaking Company website, and I can highly recommend paying them a visit if you happen to be in Portland or in the area. These wines are imported into the UK, and I've left below details of their UK importer. Next time on the podcast, Kate hands the button over to Julia Buck, Marketing Manager at the Willamette Valley Winery Association in episode 391. If you're loving the series so far, then do please consider leaving a review or a rating wherever you're listening, which means that the series and the podcast will appear higher in searches and mean that more people get to listen. And of course, I would love to have you following along with me on social media where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, and email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.